good morning. I, it's so nice to be first. I love being first with this crew. Um, Kohler, thank you for sponsoring this event. Um, to everybody that's sitting here, that um, thank you for choosing to spend your time with us. We have a lot to talk about, so I want to get into it pretty much right away. Um, but just to say, so I'm the editor of Designers Today. This is the magazine. We're not afraid of color. We like using it. It makes people pick it up when it's on the newsstand. And if you want an issue, we've got plenty of them. So um, the topic, death to neutrals. These four successful, bold designers, who better to talk about what that means? And of course, we're talking about it on a literal level as well as a figurative level. Because um, you know, literally, we're going to talk about color and pushing the envelope of design. Figuratively, it's you know making statements both you know in design, your personalities, and and in real life and in your communities. So um, I'm going to ask each designer to just briefly introduce yourself, and also please let us know where your colorful personality. To whom do you credit? Of course, it's all within yourselves. But where'd you get your spunk, Lauren? Hello. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lauren Clement, and I am the owner of Lauren Nicole Designs, an interior design firm based in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I actually credit uh, my entrepreneurial spunk, my color spunk, all of those um, inspirations in my daily design career to my mom, who has been a designer since she I was two years old. I grew up in an entrepreneurial household with my dad and my mom, both working in the design field, never knowing a uh, every two weeks paycheck. And I started my business at 23 years old and have uh, been hustling and learning and working and loving it every day since then. So that's where my background comes from. Hello, everyone. My name is Richard Aniskevich, uh, but a lot of people in the design community know me as Richard A to Z because my last name is too long for anyone to say or remember. It starts <laughs> with an A and ends with a Z, so everyone calls me Richard A to Z. Uh, but I uh, truly, design has just always been a sincere passion of me. Uh, like ever since I was young, I mean, I was the kid in like fifth, sixth grade getting Architectural Digest, and you know, it's always been a very big part of me. And what's funny is in my immediate family, there's no one per se like with a very creative spirit or whatnot. So I can't really tell you, uh, you know, where it came from, but it's just always been a part of me. Hello, I am Bregan Jane, and I run a company called Bregan Jane Designs. And I think a lot of our bold sort of heart comes from where we are located, which is Los Angeles, but specifically Venice Beach. And there's just a lot of culture and a lot of color, and you see it on the walls in graffiti, but you also see it in these spectacular coastal homes. Um, I am a Capricorn, so I'm capricious, and I like to push boundaries, and I was born that way. <laughs> I'm a Gemini. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vanessa DeLeon. Uh, I'm an interior designer, lifestyle expert, and I specialize in residential and commercial design. And doing that, I love, uh, I think my, my bold design and my color comes from my heritage. I'm Cuban-American, and in Cuba, there's bright colors and splashes of these old 60s cars that you see in the streets, and I'm really inspired by that. Um, and I love neutrals, too, so there's kind of like a fine line between both. Uh, so I sort of teeter on the edge with both. Okay, starting with Lauren, we're going to first just get down to color. Uh, you said, and I, I always stalk everybody's Instagram and take their quotes, you know, it helps me get prepared for these things. You said, I vote for more color in 2020 and believe that color is coming back in a big way. Why do you think it's coming back in a big way and what will it look like? Yes, so I think we have all seen and, you know, our clients in America sort of got uh, very comfortable with this all white kitchen, this very neutral, every sofa had to be white. And I think that scared a lot of people, but everybody kind of hopped on the bandwagon and said, well, this is what I'm supposed to be doing is creating this very neutral, very simple palette. Um, and now, granted, and like uh, you said, every everybody is a little different and you love neutrals, you love colors. It's finding that per what makes you happy as an individual, but I think you take the neutral palette and infuse color where you can, 
where you're comfortable. I just did a kitchen in all blue cabinetry and that was her comfort zone and she loves it. Now that wouldn't be the same for everybody, uh, but creating splashes of color, whether it's in a bathroom accent tile or a bathroom vanity or pillows on a sofa, if you can infuse the right amount of color that makes you happy, I, I am all for kind of pushing the envelope and creating a space with color uh, within your comfort zone because that just makes us feel good uh, when we can introduce a little bit of brightness and happiness into a space. So I vote for color. <laughs> so um, Richard has uh, is working on um, opening up the Nashville Design Collective, which is going to be an incredible new source, resource for designers. And specifically, he was chosen to be the lead designer at Design Galleria, um, which, it, the, with, which is headquartered in Atlanta, which is amazing. So, yay. What I want to know is, here you are building a new um, showroom. What role will color play in the showroom? Sure. So, to your point, um, so I'm the lead designer of Design Galleria Kitchen and Bath Studio, opening their uh, second location in Nashville, but it is a part of the Nashville Design Collective, owned by um, Matthew Quinn, who's a phenomenal designer uh, based in Atlanta. Um, so, you know, he's taking on the whole center, and, you know, it's been really fun to be a piece of the puzzle, you know, opening up the kitchen and bath uh, showroom within that. Um, so as far as color representation in the showroom, there's no question that we love, you know, making a statement. And so there's um, a beautiful lacquered teal butler's pantry. There's a really soft blue uh, traditional kitchen. I mean, there's definitely color represented um, through the spaces. But, you know, for us, it's definitely we are very thoughtful about our material execution in the full room environment, and that's really important. So, you know, I think I can definitely appreciate with what Vanessa's saying, there's certain neutrals and things that are extremely relevant and it can be super sophisticated. It's all about how you're finding this beautiful balance of it all, and there's no question that color um, can make big statements. And, you know, for me, a lot of the times I use it in these little jewel box rooms. Like, I love doing full lacquered rooms where you're, you know, taking the crown and the base and all of the trim and millwork and, you know, using a color hue. So if you come off more of a primary space and go into this jewel box, I think it's those things that make a huge impact with color. Thank you. Bregan. Um, Bregan does a lot of restaurant design in, in addition to residential design. And so I'm curious if the role of color is any different, if you use it differently in commercial or residential. Definitely. So one of the things I love about residential design right now is that my clients are getting a lot more bold. So it's, I'm having a lot of fun with wallpaper. And it started sort of the beginning of this year with deep, bold paints. But now we're actually able to convince our clients to do like a sage green tile in a bathroom. So that's where I'm really seeing it in residential. Commercial, the use of color really speaks to all of our subconscious. So one of the things our team does from the very beginning is really goes into the color psychology and how that space is going to make you feel, especially in a commercial space where a lot of people are gonna be interacting. It's a mood setter. Vanessa. So. <laughs> For my research for this, to get to know Vanessa, because I hadn't met her before, I watched a lot of your videos on Open House TV. And they're fabulous. If you're thinking about expanding your video presence, watch some of yours. So um, you were in one of your clients' dining rooms explaining your design. And you said, though I use a monochromatic color scheme throughout the house, I am not a slave to it. And I like just loved your assertion of independence, you know, because it was this beautiful gray blanket, you know, and then you went with these sapphire velvet chairs. So just how do you, you know, get out of that, like, you know, gray and, and pump it up? Well, uh, like the panelists are saying here, I think it's about punching colors where they need, like the chairs, for example, or a wallpaper on the wall that would set the tone. And it'll have colors of the natural palettes throughout, but there'll be a bold flower pattern that has a saffron color or a teal color, whatever it may be. So I think it's about interjecting it in places where it's unexpected, 
which is like the shock value, and I love that. Um, and like you were saying to your point about the jewel box spaces, I love doing this especially in powder rooms because people walk out of your powder room and they're like, oh my gosh, what was, what was that? So it's just those fun, unexpected places where you think that, you know, people may fall by the waistline and say maybe the powder room isn't important, but I think the powder room is the most important space because everybody frequents the bathroom when they're in your home, especially if you're having a party, and obviously the kitchen and all those, the heart of the home places. But um, I love interjecting it wherever I, I can, and I think it's important to not be fearful of it. This is actually one of my spaces on Fifth Avenue, which this client was very much more of a conservative client, so I had to make sure that I put it in places like pillows and a swing and not really on the walls, but I think that they were able to appreciate in such splashes like that. Um, Lauren has uh, a collaboration with Benjamin Moore and creating a palette of color. And so I'd love you to share how that came to be, because I'm sure that that's sort of some, you know, might be in other designers and people's heads. So how did that collaboration come about? So Benjamin Moore is a paint company that I have used since day one in my business, and that's because of the quality of the paints as well as the color selection. Um, however, there are always colors that I was thinking, gosh, if I had this gray that was just a little more blue or a little less blue, or if I had a Kelly green that was exactly in this uh, vein of, of to match a fabric that I'm working on, um, I had our local Benjamin Moore rep approach me and say, I see you using color in your designs. And how would you like to create a color, like your color of the year, that we can promote you locally and regionally to help drive traffic to their store, but also to build my brand? And it was a seamless transition to um, marry that. And we decided to do one color, and now I have about 12. <laughs> um, and that's because the colors that we created, and truly it's a collaboration, and there is more math in paint than I would have ever <laughs> known. Um, but it has been a really great opportunity to say, I think we could use this kind of color that really isn't in the palette. And believe it or not, we were able to find holes that we could fill in with some other colors. And so by seeing how I use color, I love these, uh, these are my two bathroom vanities here and two colors that I custom designed. And I think for clients and other designers locally to see how I was able to introduce color and say to clients, you can have a Kelly Green vanity and it's going to be awesome. And to take those chances, that really helps both sides, the paint company and myself and all of our clients to be able to kind of push those boundaries and introduce color in a positive way. Thanks. All right, Richard, you said, <laughs> I believe in pushing, let's talk about being a little bit fearless now with materials. I believe in pushing the boundaries on how materials should be executed. So I want to know some ways that you are pushing materials. Yeah, so well, the, one of the things that you can all truly interface with here at the show uh, is I had the honor of designing the Monogram Appliance booth over in Central Hall. And you know it's a 4,000 square foot showcase. There's three full kitchens and some um, auxiliary vignettes. And you know when you walk through that space, you'll see that thought process of how do you push the envelope of material execution. I love the idea of when I'm working with cabinetry to curate pieces like fine furniture, and I'm constantly using um, things like you know recycled leathers, uh, metal inlays, um, a lot of other um, foreign materials, um, acrylics, and things of that nature that are not commonly thought of when you're working with cabinets. So I'm constantly pulling in other materials, and I really believe in pushing the boundaries of how you execute them. So I know you had like a hair on hide yeah. on hair on hide countertop. Yes. yes, that's exactly right. So last year I, I had the booth at the show as well, and there was a hair on hide countertop, and it was a really fun conversation because, you know, I, it's really funny to me when you see like people that take it too literally, and they think like, oh, that will never work, but in the reality, hair on hide is actually extremely durable. Um, it's easily wiped. Ultimately, you know, it's a, um, you know, it's extremely durable material. It just looks 
uh, beautiful. And the same thing is like when I work with different exotic woods or veneers, I mean, they look can look very fragile, but if you're smart about using um, commercial grade like bar top finishes and things of that nature, they actually can have a lot of wear and tear. So it's really about, for me, doing your due diligence and research behind a product and you know making sure that they're executed well. And v Vanessa, I remember one of your locations, you had a sparkly wallpaper on columns, and, and I think that you're also a fan of decorating the ceilings. So can you talk a little bit about something that, you know, uh, a material that you used in an unexpected way that uh, your client just was crazy about? Oh, gosh, that's such a loaded question. But this is also yours. I yeah. love this bathroom. Oh, my God. Thank you. Like, Actually, that, that's, that's a material that's interesting. On the floor of that bathroom, there are actual novels from books. So what I did was cut them out and put them on the floor and had a company do a resin applied resin, and it cured for many days. And that was it, it was interesting installation. But um, it was a trial and error thing, and we tried and conquered. So, um, but that's an interesting installation. You would never think of using uh, novels, pages from a novel, as an installation for a floor product. Um, obviously, the resin keeps it cured, and you can clean it. So it is a bathroom; it has to be cleaned. Uh, but I, I think wallpapers have come have come such a long way as far as texture, material, colorways, um, I, grommets, and inlays and metals. And I, you know, we're seeing now a lot of installations with using Schluters as full installations on floors and walls. And I think this is where you become playful and think outside the box. And and this is where I, I love to be in that in that arena. And Bregan and Lauren, thinking about the way that you use things unexpectedly, but also pushing your clients beyond their comfort level. If you could speak to either or, how do you push clients you know, in, in a comfortable yet new territory? And I think Vanessa said it very well. Like You've got to read your client, and you sort of start them with a pillow or a bench. And then they learn to trust you. And so I'm sure with you, the lifelong relationship that you build with your clients, they tend to get bolder. By the way, I'm going to need the teal that you painted that <laughs> because I love it. And the nature of invention is not being able to find what it is you want to make. And I think there's always a balance of being the crazy artist who's also creating a home for somebody who doesn't have that eye, who, who is leaning on you. So it's, it's about listening to and pushing them in the right way. And who is paying you know, good money to have a home that is gonna last for a while, you know, not make it costly mistakes or something like that. Yes, thank you. I think that's why you know, our clients call us because they cannot replicate what they've seen anywhere. And it may be that they've got an inspiration photo that you can take, but the psychology, like you talked about, I was a psychology major in school, I use it every day. <laughs> um, whether it's making husband and wife happy uh, you know, in their design project or really figuring out what do they want? You know, when you ask a client and they say, well, I love blue and I love traditional. Well, what does that mean? Because that could mean a hundred different things. And getting inside of their head as much as possible to take what they think they want yeah. and help them go a step further. They didn't call us to replicate what they saw online or, you know, in a magazine. They called us because they want something amazing that they come home to every day and go, oh, I just love it. I couldn't have done that on my own. I, I would have never come up with that. And sometimes we show them things, which I'm sure you guys uh, understand, and they go, are you sure? Really? But it's that trust to say yes. And maybe it is showing them something that we've done in the past that is in the same concept, in the same vein. So they go, okay, I know you can pull it together, and you have that vision to make it work at the end. But it is truly communication and the relationship um, to build a successful outcome. And don't you think, like, I think like to that point, you know, in the sense of like psychology and just the process that we, or journey we really take our clients on, you know, there's, it's, I always stress to other designers of, that you can't necessarily take what your client says so literal. Like, you know, they say that, you know, I've had plenty of clients that have sat down and it's like, I really, you know, I want a white kitchen. And I'm like, I get to know them and I'm like, your kitchen is going to be black and you know this is why or whatever like I see you in a black kitchen and here's why because like I've gotten to know you now and I understand these are the things you respond to right like sometimes it's really up to us to your point like that's why they've 
hired us as the expert, right, to help, you know, lead them through this journey and, you know, tell their story, right? Like we're really, I call it, you know, being the chameleon to the client. You're taking their raw energy and ideas and you're enhancing it in every which way and imaginable. And sometimes that's showing them things that, you know, they, it's, they do feel a bit uncomfortable or whatnot, and, but that's our job is to make them feel comfortable and help them get excited about it and you know, take them through that process. Or they maybe didn't know if they liked it. Yep. And I think also, um, just for the designers out there, I think a great way of knowing the client is asking them to look in, inside their closet because I think you're able to understand who they are. If you see this very monochromatic color palette or if you see a burst of color like one of the closets that I saw in here, you know that you could be much more playful. So I think it's important to understand them and see the insides of their closets. And also, if it's a couple, look at his and hers. And then you understand why they fight so much <laughs> through the process. We are often therapists, right? <laughs> What I was going to say is, you know, no matter what kind of online quiz any client ever takes, they will never get to the depths that you get with your client. And that's one of the values that you bring that's totally irreplaceable. But let's talk about closets and fashion. And whose closet is this? Was that Brigham's? Yes. Yeah. I, Cap hands, give it away. Well, I sat with you a couple of times. Like one time when we were doing an interview, I was like, who's that queen that just walked in? Like you just had the most incredible dress. So, um, Fashion, I actually first uh, connected with Richard over a story we did about fashion. So um, here's my question. Uh, fashion has the ability to convey who we are without any words. And this ties into the whole idea of just presenting our own brands and, and who we are. Um, it's instant language. Richard, how do you use fashion to communicate who you are? I know it's on your website. Um, what do your clothes say about your brand? Yeah, so I have loved fashion. I mean, I think any of us in design, like it's just a you know part of our mindset, right? Is that it's, it's such a um, way to evoke exactly like it, truly your brand representation. And I always encourage people to realize this: like whether you work for another company um, and it's not your personal business, like you are your own brand. So think about your visual presentation. Think about the things that you know you're putting out there because you know you are your own brand. There's no one else like you in the world. So own that and, you know, make it personal. Um, and so for me, fashion has always been a huge source of inspiration. Um, I really believe in a very holistic approach in design and looking at the inspiration in the world around you. So, you know, for a lot of people, it could be other things, but for me, it's fashion. So turn to the runways and, you know, you see this beautiful shoe with some metal detail or something, and that's what influences, you know, some sort of cabinet inlay or something that I'm doing, right? I just love and encourage people to look at other industries and find out what speaks to you. Another industry that's very, as a passion of mine is like, vehicle design and industrial design segment. Um, but certainly, you know, there's no question fashion has been a big piece of it. And even to that point, in 2013, I created a continuing education course titled Fashion Forward Thinking. And I've toured, you know, across the country with that presentation at a lot of chapters. But really, the heart of it is finding the inspiration in the world around you and what speaks to you. Regan, Vanessa? I think one of the marriages that um, fashion and interior design have is textiles. So there's a lot of prints and the inspiration that those bring will help set the stage to a whole room. And I think as representatives of ourselves and as our brands, it's fun to be able to lean into that. Like people expect an interior designer to show up. So a caftan is where I started to lean as I got busier and busier because it's one great beautiful textile that just says, I'm going to be bold, I'm going to be the artist you expect, but also I had no time to get ready because we are all so busy. <laughs> and Jane, I've always been a, a fan of your fashion and the way that you carry color on yourself. And it does, it speaks to you and who the magazine really is. And, you know, what will I wear to this panel? I mean, for sure, you know, I, I don't know if you saw the back of my shirt, but I have to show it to you because... I like the back better than the front. Um, but, and Vanessa, for your videos, you know, I would love to go into your closet because she, you, you show up in such an amazing um, outfit, like per video. You know, you get into the, it's like method acting. 
So, yeah, I actually always say fashion was my first passion. So I graduated from FIT with a fashion degree. So it really, for me, it's, it's more important than sometimes interior design, but it comes, they, they both share the common thread. So I always look into fashion before I design anything. Actually, all my inspiration boards, when I present to a client, there is some kind of fashion um, influence on the, on the presentation board, whether it's something of the season, whether it's a shoe like you mentioned, or this a beautiful dress and kind of working it with the theme of the presentation, the clients start, sort of understand that as a visual. And, um, and I think also as, as you, as a representation of your business and your brand and your firm and the way you market yourself, I think it's, it's a part of everything. It's a part of the branding. And um, I think walking into presentations or a guest panel presentation, the reason why I'm wearing yellow is because I'm the brand ambassador for True Refrigeration and their color this year is saffron. So come check out their booth at Center Hall. So I think it's important to kind of tie that into everything that you're doing in life or even like color trends. You know, whether whatever color is in trend in the season, I sort of wear it a lot more through the season than I would another color that wasn't in vogue. It's fun getting dressed and choosing <laughs> these. And Lauren, not, you know, your, um, when I first went to your website, I was like, you have a very soothing palette, you know, and yes, these punches of colors, like we saw that, um, what is that color called? It's called fennel something, isn't it? That green, fresh fennel, I love it too. It's that teal that you uh, okay. popped. Yeah, you know, but this feels very much in line with, with the, you know, just the basic vibe. Yes, I think, uh, thank you. I'm all about comfort. You know, it, your home needs to be a, a representation of you but pushed, you know, just a little bit with the excitement. So my shoes, for example, are where I have the little pop of excitement. But, and your earrings. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> Details, right? So, and that's how I look at a room is I want this to be welcoming and inviting, a breath of fresh air, sort of a whole as well. You know, I like to see a room um, where you don't have necessarily one element that just grabs you and steals all the attention. I want it to sort of feel, um, you know, sort of one cohesive, comfortable breath of fresh air, but you have these little hidden gems just like the back of your shirt. That's what I was thinking. That's a nice little peekaboo or excitement statement piece that really can just say uh, who you are, and that's true in, in my terms of how I dress as well. And, you know, when you open, or client opens the front door to meet you, that is exactly how they see you and kind of carry through their comfort level and how you're representing kind of what your, your plan and your philosophy is going to be with them. So now I want to move from uh, design to more of sort of fearlessness that is in our heads. And so I took a few inspirational um, statements about fear and I wrote them on a little card and I just want to read them because I, these, this is something that I could read every day. It would really help me through everything. Um, fearlessness is not the absence of fear but the mastery of it. Fear is limiting. It limits our thoughts, feelings, and potential. To live in fear is to have little regard for what we're capable of. What learning to be fearless means is figuring out where, where irrational anxiety ends and real danger begins, and overcoming the first to deal with the second. Fear is the enemy only if you let it overwhelm you. Without fear, there is no courage. So one thing that I love in my getting to know you, and it's only the beginning, is that, yeah, it's not like you're absent of it, but you go beyond your comfort level. So Bregan, I want to start with you. Um, Bregan is the one of the designer co-stars of the new set uh, launching TV series. Ex Extreme Makeover Home Edition. Yeah. And it's coming out February 16th, but that's a great place to start with fear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so debuting February 16th. So, yeah. you know, I, I know in your own brand, you have your goals and you're rolling those things out. And here you got a show. So I'd just love to know about how that came to be and what you pushed through. Yeah, that took a lot of courage to push through on every level. I mean, first off, Brady, who's in this audience here today, told me, we as a team, we're going to build 10 houses in 10 weeks. And I am a designer on this stage who has 
none of us ever get an opportunity to do that. So there was a lot of fear involved in being a part of a project that's so big and wondering how you're gonna individualize these personalities, but also their life-changing homes. And each family is so specific that it is one of the biggest challenges that I've ever faced. But there was so much support and such a great design team behind me. I'm so excited for everybody to see it because there really is such individualized attention for each one of these families. Did, did you have a specific role? Um, like, yeah. are you a, the designer who does what? Well, they make fun of me for elevating everything. But <laughs> uh, I worked with the, our carpenters here, and the, who's also a designer. We had a design team of three, and then an army behind us who really helped all of this happen behind the scenes. So it was amazing to be a designer on this new rendition. But fear also played into what am I going to do with my company? And who am I going to leave behind to run it while I'm on the road? And I'm a single mother, so I have two kids. And who's going to love them and kiss them goodnight while I'm gone? And I also struggle with anxiety, I think, like we all do. I don't like getting on the plane to come here. Um, but you constantly just ask yourself, what do I want out of life? And what am I willing to push past to get there? And every time I go there, as small as it is to put on my headphones and get on a plane, I know I want to be here in a part of this panel. And I'm not going to be the person who doesn't take that flight. And I do that everywhere in my life. But Fear is there. It's looking at me. It's knocking. And I'm just going, no, not today. Mm -hmm. Vanessa, I mean, I, I, love, I love what you just said. And I think that I think we all can speak to it. So I do want to hear a little bit. Because Vanessa, I look at you and I think she is such a badass. But, we, but fear has to be part of your life and overcoming it. Can you talk to it? Yeah, so actually this year marks 20 years. 2020 marks 20 years that I have been in business. And I have to say there was a lot of trials and tribulations throughout the way. And every single day I have a, a boutique firm, but every single day I'm like, is it going to be okay? Am I going to meet my, you know, my, my monthly quota? Am I going to be able to pay the bills? And this is 20 years in the business. It's a struggle every single day. And it may look glamorous and beautiful on Instagram, but... There's behind the scenes stuff that we're always fearful of, and that's the reality. It's, it's not so much the glamour, it's the grunt. It's the every day, and I, and I let me tell you, the, congratulations um, to you, because I know what that feels like, doing various shows throughout the years. It becomes a memory, and one that you fulfilled, and you say, I did it, and I'm a badass. So, and I, and I commend you, because I have a 19-month-old, and getting on a plane um, yesterday was hard. But then you're here, and then you see all of you here and listening to us, and it's so rewarding. And I feel grateful and humbled every day for it. And this is a part of the fear that I overcome when I sit in these panels with people like you who are real and seeing people out there that are listening to us. And for me, it's not a fear anymore. I've conquered it. I, I think before we get to um, when, when we're feeling scared, you know, and try and recognize why that is, Sometimes it's because um, you don't know something or you need somebody, you know, like that idea that we're not alone, you know, that we are part of this bigger community, that somebody can help you, um, you know, and, and w that we feed off each other and, and get distracted out of the fear is a great thing. Richard, you just moved your life from <laughs> the <laughs> southeast to Nashville yes. and filling shoes. I mean, Matthew Quinn, you know, like, that must have been quite an honor, but did you feel any fear? Like, <gasps> can I do this? Huge, yeah, um, there's no question that I had a, you know, huge fear uh, of that because, you know, I had a really good thing going in the Washington DC area and was working on really great projects. But, you know, um, I, along my journey, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Matthew Quinn and Ann Pericelli, who are the owners of the new design center opening up in Nashville. And I respect them a ton. They're super talented people. And I wanted to be a part of that team. And so, you know, that was definitely something that was easy for me to, you know, feel at ease with and the idea that I wanted to be a part of it. And so 
I had no friends or contacts there. I had no um, real, you know, even in the sense of the industry and whatnot, you know, no um, installers and contractors and things of that nature. I mean, it is really starting it um, from, you know, pr pretty much from scratch there. But um, there's no question that I think it's, in design, you have to be willing to challenge those fears and take risks and things of that nature. And something I er learned very early on in my career that helped me overcome fear was the idea of presenting, like when a client comes to you with a budget, for example, and you know, especially starting out, you're usually working with clients with smaller budgets, right? And so something that helped me start to overcome fear was I would present them a plan or an idea in their budget, and then I would present them with a much bigger, greater idea that I knew was much more creative and interesting. And I felt like it wasn't a huge risk because the worst they could say is no, and I provided them something within their budget, right? But what that helped me do is get very confident, and then I became really good at upselling to these bigger projects, where as soon as they would see, you know, I would double or triple their budget because they saw this greater idea. And so, you know, it's things like that that you kind of learn along the way that's really helped me um, challenge the idea of fear. Lauren? In this, the context of these questions, um, how do you deal with it? And you know, do you go by your gut? Do you make pro-con lists? What's fear to you, and how do you get through it? So I think fear is is a motivator for all of us, and I agree with all of these things that that everybody has set up here. It may be a fear of, hmm, I might be twiddling my thumbs in a little bit. Do what projects are coming down the line, or oh my gosh, I have 10 projects, I have two little girls, I'm supposed to be a, a, a functioning wife, I have all of these things on my plate, how am I gonna do this, all of this, and do it all well to the best of my ability? Um, so those are some fears I feel like on, on a daily business base um, that I just embrace. and. I take little bits at a time. Somebody, I think my dad said, how do you eat an elephant? You know, one bite at a time years ago. And I literally adopt that and say that to myself every day. What has to be done right now? What can be done an hour from now? And what can be done tomorrow? I am just a true taskmaster. However, I have an amazing village behind me and I could not do this without all of them, be it in my office, my family, or the great team of people in my uh, out in the field, contractors, painters, electricians, etc., who I have leaned on and built an awesome team around because I know it's not just me. I am not by myself. And for my business, the last four years has become very heavy in renovation work, which is not how I started. And it is a field that I frankly have had to teach myself a lot about to get to the comfort zone where somebody can say, here's my 10,000 square foot house, I wanna make it all over, every bit of it, okay, go. And I say, well, okay, that's a little terrifying, but I'm gonna figure it out. And that motivates me to be a better designer and a better person every single day, as stressful as sometimes that may be, um, but I love that part of our business. Um, this kind of has to do with what you said about budgets, Richard, but it's more about what you are worth. And when, you know, you all started out as, uh, when you opened up your own businesses as entrepreneurs, you know, quoting uh, your fee and being scared that somebody's going to run or not. Can you talk a little bit about how you came to, uh, to ask for what you think you're worth? <laughs> And not be scared that others yeah. would, you know, run. I got to say, this was probably the hardest part of the business to understand. And um, one thing I, I want to mention, pay yourself first. And I never really understood that um, because I was like, well, no, I have to pay my staff and I can work for free. And it's like, you know, it's, it's the sweat equity. But really, you, you have to pay yourself first. And that's, that's one thing that I just want to stress. Um, but what I, do, what I do and what I've done in the past is I take, what, what does it cost to run a business? What is my monthly rent? What is my overhead? What's my pay? What is, you know, the fax machine, the phone, my cell phone, gas? And I put an Excel sheet together. And then what I do is divide that by the year. Then from the year I divided by the hour, from the hour I divided by the minutes, and from the minutes I divided by the seconds. And then I said, wow. 
have to make X, Y, Z in order to make this work per week. And that's how I came up my, with my hourly fee. So, I, and then obviously for me, it's a little bit higher now just because of my experience. And I am in New York, so there's designers that charge $100 to $5,000 an hour. So I'm kind of one, I'm in between that. Uh, but I think understanding who your competition is, who, um, if, if you see a designer that sort of looks like you, feels like you, what are they charging? What are their fees? What kind of get to know the, the industry around you. Obviously, you don't want to. You can upsell, but you don't want to be completely out of the box, or you don't want to be too low because then you don't really you don't show your worth. So I think it's important to st stay somewhere in the middle where it makes sense financially to your firm, and do those calculations, and you'll see exactly how much you need to make an hour. And I actually came up with this on my own. I didn't find it in a book or in interior design school. I just said, "Gee, what is it? To, what is it? How much do I need to make to run my business?" And then you take your designers and you divide that number as well and you kind of see where you're at. And it's interesting to find that out. So everybody do those calculations. You'll, you'll, be, you'll be pretty surprised. And I think there's a lot of honesty and transparency in doing it that way. So one of the things that we've done as a firm is we separate out what you pay us and what you're paying to actually get the work done and what you're getting materials for. We do no percentage or upcharge. And that made us incredibly popular in Los Angeles because my client could trust that I wasn't trying to sell them something because there was some hidden agenda in it for me. But because of that, I had to definitely command a rate that was like any professional, you know, like you pay a doctor or a lawyer. This is what you're going to pay us. But then, so I can sleep at night, I want to make sure that when we're doing these designs and when we're transforming spaces, that we are going to walk away and feel like I put equity inside something that you own and have worked hard to own. And so these kitchen remodels, these bath remodels, I know we've all seen it. Contractors come in, they don't know what they're doing. A lot of times clients have bad previous experiences. So at the end of the day, I want to walk away from their total bill and go, I still feel like I gave them something and something they've worked hard to own. Because it's also your canvas. Yeah. So that's a representation of you and that's part of you. So that the canvas is important. You're, you're the artist and that's your canvas. The execution is as important because it has to look like your vision ultimately. Yeah. And my first entrepreneurial business was a clothing store when I was 18. And I miss the fearless 18-year-old inside myself even now because the more you learn, it's, it's harder to really grow your business, you know? It's, it's fun to do it fearlessly and boldly. I think the last question and this question go hand in hand, which is the fear. You know, you can say to a client, a new prospective client, this is how I charge, this is my fee structure, this is what you get, and you may get pushback and that may be fearful to say no you know this is what I do and if if you're not okay with that we may just not be the right fit for each other and to say that and know there's another client on the other side that is going to be the right fit so and that was when I started out thinking oh well shoot should I have just you know molded that a little bit for that particular job or that particular client I think I did that once and then thought that was a really bad idea because I got taken advantage of and I didn't do that again so knowing your self-worth and your value and putting that fear aside to say this is what I do, and you called me because I am that good and I am worth it to be able to give you what you're looking for, um, I think is a huge value in, in what we can offer. And I think to that point too, you know, thinking about what, what, that we all can appreciate, and you know, design, when you take it, you know, it truly is your passion, you think of it as your art or your canvas, whatever that may be, you know, your self-worth. And naturally, an artist, you question that of like, is this good enough? Is this, you know, worth it? Like, you know, you want this to be like the most memorable, beautiful kitchen or beautiful interior design space, right? So you're always questioning like, is it good enough? And so I think it's definitely just being really logical about it, like Vanessa was saying, and, you know, kind of taking the facts and, and separating the emotion from it. Can and I honesty? Also, oh, well, yeah. yeah. Um, to your point, I feel like the, the artist, right? 
when somebody walks into a gallery and they see a painting that's a thousand dollar and one that's a hundred thousand dollar, what sets that artist apart from the other? They may have started at the same time. It's just the matter of the recognition and what their value and what their worth is. So kind of treat it like that. Like you're the artist and this is the number and it is what it is. And I felt the same way. I've lost a couple jobs because maybe they felt it was too high or whatever it was. And I was like, wow, should I had, uh, and then you go back and forth. And then you know that chapter's closed, but note to self, a better and bigger project comes next. And always remember that, even though you'll, hindsight 2020 and you could have done this and maybe it was a spectacular job and you may have lost a client that would have been the bane of your existence for the rest of your life. So keep that in mind. Did you want to say something, Brigham? I was just going to speak to the honesty, too. Um, I think that's a big part of knowing your worth is telling clients, I don't, I don't like that, but I'll put it in that room. And I, I often find myself doing that because at the end of it, our worth is our true art. And so sometimes you feel pushed to like make them happy, but I've been known time and time again to just go, if you love that chandelier and it makes you happy, we will put it in that room and it will work. But I no, I don't love it. But, but then this they'll is question in my house. it. They'll yes. definitely question it. But but it also allows them to trust that what you're telling them and what you're building for them is true and honest. And and for them. So bring in. I know that you um, one of your side talents is um, DJing. And I always feel like I you know I don't know what you do when you're going like to a big job like a big presentation. But I. Like, I like to listen to some music and dance around the house a little bit and get pumped, you know? So, starting with you, like, is there a song that would be on your, you know, let's get fearless playlist? So, write these things down. Um, Alicia Keys just released a new song called Underdog, and it's like my anthem, and it's a good one with the kids, too, and she's amazing, and it's brand new. So, if you haven't checked out Underdog by Alicia Keys, it's one that, like, gets you ready in the morning. Vanessa? Oh gosh, I'm a, I'm a big Beyonce fan when I want to get hyped, and I love Alicia Keys as well, but um, uh, I guess, which is the one, uh, the Girls Run the World, or whatever that song, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that's my women empowerment moment, or my alter ego that comes out. She has an alter ego also, and mine's, mine's there as well. <laughs> so, uh, I have a Spotify account, and it is the most random yeah, yeah, music. Yeah. Like, it can <laughs> hop from, like, Frank Sinatra to Jay-Z and, you know, Delighted. the click of a button. So it, I love music. It's a huge source of inspiration for me. It motivates me. It's like, so when I'm trying to get in a creative spirit, I'm often, like, looking for songs, and I'll get, like, really hooked on a song and whatever it is. So it's always very random, but that's a huge, you know, energizer for me. There's no question. Oh my gosh, one. Um, well, go by the Monogram Appliance booth because I made the playlist, so you'll hear way more than one. And, and, that, and so that, feel that energy and that, you know, is good representation. Okay, so I too like all kinds of different music across the board, you know, country music, some 90s rap sometimes if you need a little good uh, motivator, any uh, good female, you know, hip hop artist for sure. But I also like to kind of visualize what I'm about to go do because as hyped up as I may be, I'm kind of trying to figure out, you know, what I'm gonna say and how this is gonna work and I wanna see it being successful in my head. So um, I think it's a little bit of both and multitasking along the way is also <laughs> um, sort of what I feel like happens uh, on my adventure to a, uh, a project is always phone calls and that's why I wanna get in a good space whether it's music or visualizing to be able to have a clear head to go into a client presentation. I can listen to probably four songs from the Greatest Showman uh, movie. This is me, of course. And then, uh, anyway, that puts me in a really good mood. Um, so, do we have time for Q and A? We have five minutes for questions. Does anybody want to ask these lovely designers a question? Don't be scared. <laughs> Don't be fearful. Hi, thank you for speaking today. Um, 
I myself am uh, currently a design interior design student, um, getting ready to try to make a career change, and I'm here with some of my fellow students. And I always find it interesting to hear kind of um, how your path into interior design began. So if you could go back to the beginning, just a quick synopsis would be awesome. So uh, for me, I studied interior design at Virginia Tech and it happened to be an NKBA accredited design program and that's how I got really connected to kind of this world uh, on the kitchen and bath uh, segment of it and you know my first KBiz I was a design student it was 2008 Chicago and I'll always remember this show because it was very inspirational to me it made the industry very tangible and you know I could see myself working in it and I said one day at that I said one day at this show, I hope to have a booth here that inspires other people. And over the last five years, I've had the opportunity to be able to do that. And, you know, I just got extremely active, you know, being new to this. I so encourage you to get out here and just start shaking everyone's hands, get business cards, follow up with people. You know, it's all what you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. So I was um, in graduate school for clinical psychology and had a change of heart as to what my career path was going to be. And growing up with a designer mother, I turned to her as my mentor and teacher and truly got started on the decorating side of the business. Um, and as my business evolved and I was asked to do more and more things, I am very self-taught and industry taught, taking classes along the way to learn and grow my education in all the different parts of the field, but I think, like you said, immersing yourself, getting to know as many people as you can, and today is very different from when I started my business 14 years ago, um, as far as how you're getting yourself known and exposure to clients. Um, I think our business is one of feet on the ground as fast as yours will take you in order to get you where you want to go. Um, I started... I Fashion was my first passion, so I went to FIT and I graduated, acquired an amazing position at Ralph Lauren and realized very quickly it was like the movie The Devil Wears Prada. So I, I decided to run quickly and um, I wasn't catty at all. I'm, all. I'm all about uplifting women and I felt that industry was a little toxic in that respect. So I was putting myself through college working for my father's furniture store and uh, I went back to it, and then people would ask me, oh, can you come over? I wanna match my window treatments to my bedding and the area rugs, and it became from selling furniture and manufacturing furniture to actually helping them decorate. And then it was, the next question was like, oh, I wanna blow out a wall, and I wanna go higher, and I'm like, whoa, I don't even know what a load-bearing wall was at the time, so I had to go back to school and, and went back to interior design school, but I felt behind the eight ball a little bit, so I ended up opening up my business my freshman year of design school, um, and here I am 20 years later. Interior design found me and definitely like hit me in the face. I had always been in creative roles and started in fashion as well with a clothing store and a clothing line. Um, but what's interesting to me as I look back at my career is to see the parts that feel the most secure and successful in me now were always there all along. Like I was moving, you know, my friend's living room around using towels before I even recognized that interior design was going to be the career that is what feels like I'm meant to do. I also really love having mentors along the way and not always in my same professional field, but being able to have a relationship with somebody who was secure in themselves and could give me big pictures of ideas of how to grow and become more of myself was sometimes more helpful when they weren't in the same industry as myself. And I also think being a part of associations like the ASID, IID, IDS, I think those are also important associations to be involved in and organizations that will help you grow as well. Awesome. Um, yeah. Can you talk about um, branding yourself? How did you do that? Did you hire somebody to do it? Did you have your own thought in your head that you wanted to have, I want it to look like this? or? How did you go about that? So for me, it was very much um, kind of an intuitive thing that I feel like 
again, just being in design, I started getting, as I mentioned earlier, like truly fifth, sixth grade, I was getting like Architectural Digest, uh, Vanity Fair, like different magazines that I just loved looking at the ads and things that were so inspirational to me. So what in my mind I started curating since I was young was this idea of like what brand do I want to create and what does that look like and you know I just like along the way kind of collected ideas and now I think because for so long I studied that it's been a lot more intuitive for me over time uh, but I would definitely encourage you to like look at other parallel and other industries like you know, if are there other designers you look up to, that's great, but I don't really believe in copycatting. I think, like, look at other industries, like what, you know, in fashion, what's a line you respond to, uh, in, you know, a vehicle that you respond to, things like that. Like, look at their branding, what you respond to. I think that's really important. I think as you grow your business and start your business, you find out what your brand is going to look like. What are the goals that you want other people to see you or the design aesthetics that you want other people to recognize about you? Uh, today, social media is the best platform to say who you are to the masses. Um, and Instagram has honestly become a huge part of, of my daily um, business, but it's really actually been great to have clients that find you, like real legitimate clients that find you today even versus two years ago but I'm also speaking to all of you and beyond as to who I am and I do have a PR team but they do not do my Instagram I post myself every day the stories are all mine um, I started about five years ago I had somebody doing posts when Facebook was bigger than Instagram for me and I edited every single thing she posted because it wasn't me. And I thought, well, this is silly. Um, and so now I do all of my own Instagram and social media because it's the only way somebody's gonna know truly who I am. Thank you. Um, we're out of time. So um, next, the next show, thank you, Lauren, Richard, thank Brian, you. Vanessa, thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you for coming. Thank you all. Thank you.